Hi, I'm Caitlin. Hi, I'm Rebecca. We're not from Memphis, but we love it. Welcome to Memphis Type History, the podcast. Hello, Rebecca Phillips here. And as you already know from our intro, I am not from Memphis, but it did not take me long to consume barbecue in Memphis. And the years that I've been here, I consistently enjoy eating barbecue. And I don't think I ever thought about the history of it, which many of you might find odd because this is, we're a project on Memphis history. Why wouldn't we cover barbecue history? So today with me is Brian Crenshaw, who uh, turns out to be a barbecue connoisseur. Brian, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Rebecca. Yes. Yes. One, I've appreciated you as an artist for a long time and uh, you and Michael and but I appreciate you doing a podcast on just things historical to Memphis. I think it's needed in such a rich city and so much history and so many unique things that people aren't able to pull back the curtain at times and see. So thanks for shining a great spotlight on some of those things that people may not really think about day in and day out, but that really expresses the rich history of Memphis. So yeah, thanks for having me here. Oh, thank you. That was really kind. I promise I didn't have him like ask him to do that. To <laughs> talk she did about not. That. Oh yeah, I verified. She did not. <laughs> Um, so let me go ahead and tell you why I'm here, Brian, because I think it's important for you to know. I was invited a while back to a talk about Memphis history on race. And the speaker was Jason Cook, who's a pastor at Fellowship Memphis. And he had teamed up with Dr. Charles McKinney, who's the chair of African Studies and Associate Professor of History. Are you familiar with this? You probably are. Yes. Yes. Okay. Great talk. Uh, great. I guess it, it felt like a class. And so the environment's great. The content was great. And towards the end of that whole speech that Jason was talking about, he, he brought up history of Memphis barbecue. And the first thing he said is, if you know Brian Crenshaw, <laughs> you need to ask him about Memphis barbecue because he gives a great presentation about Memphis barbecue and barbecue in general. So obviously I remembered that. And then it was probably just a few days later, I ran into one of your coworkers who, <laughs> again, it gets brought up, Brian Crenshaw and his tour of barbecue and <laughs> history behind it. And I got to say, Brian, we worked together years ago and somehow I missed this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's something that's grown a, a little bit over the past few years, but, um, you know, to work back a little bit, I grew up in Northwest Tennessee, so I'm I'm not a Memphian, but Memphis was the big city, so we would come here for concerts and ball games, and I just remember growing up, we would get the Memphis news, and you know, so you, you can't grow up in West Tennessee without the history of Memphis and the culture of Memphis being part of your life, so I always felt like I was a Memphian, but barbecue was a big piece of that, and obviously, growing up in West Tennessee, barbecue was something that We ate. We appreciated Memphis's rich tradition. But when I moved to Memphis, you would hear of people talking about, well, this place has the best barbecue. And a friend of mine, uh, we sat down one day and said, let's not just figure out who has the best barbecue in Memphis, because I'm not sure that's possible. There's so many great places, but let's figure out who has the best of each item. Who has the best ribs? Who has the best nachos? Who has the best pulled pork? And so on. And so the early genesis of some of this is we started the Barbecue Club of Memphis, which was really just an excuse for <laughs> some friends. Uh, and, and it was strategic. We wanted to see some guys from different racial backgrounds come together, eat great barbecue, talk about the barbecue, but really talk about um, things that go on in Memphis, uh, things to do with race. And, and, you know, this was some of the early days of fellowship starting. So it was a great almost arena for us to just discuss things of racial diversity and issues in the city and fun things in the city. And so that, as we start having a couple kids, that that got expensive in some ways, <laughs> and I shelved it for a few years. But uh, some of this talk originated. Uh, I was doing a manhood talk for our students. I work with students here at Fellowship and Families. And I was doing a ceremony for our dads and some of the their sons. I just enjoy barbecue, enjoy researching some of the history. And definitely, I don't cook it. I just like to eat it and read about it. So... <laughs> Um, but giving that talk, there was a, a gentleman in the audience of, of that that wanted me to do something for a group that was coming in town. So I continued to research it, put some of this together, started really being fascinated with how the history of Memphis, that you can't separate 
Memphis's history from race, from civil rights movement. You can't separate it from uh, blues and Bill Street and the music scene, but kind of a third strand of that that you can't separate Memphis from is barbecue, that it really carries a strong history just like those other two. But then I started seeing how those all three were intertwined and that led into one thing to another and and just over time has evolved. But yeah, so I just like eating and talking about barbecue. So that's (laughs) a little bit of the backstory of how we we, started a club. Yeah. Well, and that that doesn't exist anymore, but (laughs) we, we, you know, but that's how deep you were in it. Yeah, you know, we, we're taking this seriously. We're gonna yeah. Yeah. start a club. <laughs> yeah, and and you know this was this was early on uh, before you know blogs and all that really started. But just you know we we go back to I even talked about this in my talk. It's not the question is it who has the best barbecue because other cities will will claim that and and I, I do think that Memphis although there are other cities that have great barbecue. Memphis is the the king of, of barbecue for many reasons. The question isn't whether Memphis has the best barbecue, but the question is how do you eat the world's best barbecue, which is Memphis? Do you eat it with dry rub or do you eat it wet? Or you know, So there's uh, a lot of different opinions on even how you eat Memphis barbecue and do you prefer ribs, do you prefer pulled pork? So it's fascinating. It's like this yeah. subculture that... I've just got swept into, but I'm fascinated by. So, and we can agree that Memphis barbecue. We're talking about the pig, right? It, has it always been? Yes, I think when when most Americans think about barbecue, you think about a pig that's smoked over a, a period of time. And obviously, you've got Texas barbecue, which uh, is brisket. It's it's beef. Um, but what we typically see is is pork barbecue. You know, Memphis really innovated some of those things and. DeSoto brought 13 pigs to the New World, and they thrived. And, and as he went up through the colonies and made his way west, uh, and Memphis, part of his history, is the, the bridge is named after him, but you had uh, these innovations that took place along the way. But Memphis's location on the Mississippi River and the port, and just its location that was strategic with uh, sugarcane coming up through the south and, and molasses and the access to West Tennessee being so such a rich place for tomatoes, um, mm-hmm. got Ripley tomatoes here in West Tennessee, but that molasses and tomato base really created the Memphis sauce. Um, so yeah, it evolved over time, um, but I think when most people think of barbecue in its purest form, I, I think of Memphis barbecue. And even Kansas City, which gets a lot of publicity, actually was uh, a Memphian that went and took that to Kansas City. So when you're eating hey, Kansas hey. City barbecue, you're really eating Memphis barbecue style so I think in its purest form, yeah, barbecue is pig when we think about it. I think, you know, in researching this, the, the word barbecue, there is debated some of what that comes from. Uh, but most historians would say it comes from the word barbacoa, which is something that uh, the native Indians to Hispaniola had that word. It means sacred fire pit. And it's just the whole idea of cooking meat slowly. That's what barbacoa means? Yes. Okay. So I, think, idea of, I just think of head of the cow because yeah. that's what we ate in Texas. Yeah. But yeah. So, no. okay. Yeah. And again, uh-huh. there's so much myth and fable and, and mixed history in this. You, no one really probably knows, but it, it, yeah. it seems that, I mean, there's been cultures throughout time cooking slow meat over fire. But I think as, as the Soto came to the new world and saw pigs thrive in the in the South. And, and a lot of what we know as barbecue was really birthed out of the plantation. And you would have slave owners that would throw big parties. You cook a whole pig. Um, they would discard the leftovers to the slaves. And the slaves really perfected cooking lesser desired cuts of meat into what became a delicacy. So, But I think when you, when you think of race, it's interesting. During Reconstruction, after the Civil War, you saw some, some ways that barbecue transcended race and economics. And you ha- you would have uh, free slaves at that point open up roadside pits that um, white Southerners would actually go to. So it's almost like a reversal of Jim Crow before we really saw that instituted. So, you know, there was, it was something that always drew people across different classes and different races. Bill Street was the hub of music. It was the hub of a lot of civil rights, progressive thought and barbecue is at the centerpiece of that food wise and you know yeah. thinking about walking into bill street in in that time in that era um, hearing the blues in such a raw form and the smell of barbecue and the hope and the spark of what became the civil rights movement all seemed to be intertwined so that, that's fascinating to me to see how 
uh, all of that was going on at once. You can't really separate those things. So, um, what's your favorite? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm, I'm, uh, yeah, we can talk that. You know, people ask my favorite. That's that's a great question. Let's, let's go there for a minute. You you think about different um, places. I like to make barbecue. Uh, put them in different classifications. You have your, what I call a joint, which is different than a sit down restaurant. When I think of, you know, sit down restaurant, like uh, central barbecue, that's a little different than um, maybe a place that's a walk up counter with a, a few seats in it. Um, Do we have any of those here? Yeah. Like I, I would classify something like barbecue shop or Corky's or central would be more sit down restaurants. You know, you've got um, cozy corners, sit down, right? Yeah, and, and well, and I think some of them have really evolved. Like if you think about the Corkies on Poplar, the main Corkies, you've got what probably was an original pit on the side of a road that then evolved into a drive-in as cars became more prevalent. And Memphis, actually, Memphis had the world's first drive-in. It's called Fortune's Jungle. I'd have to look it up, but it's really interesting that Memphis innovated so many things, but the drive-in first was drive -in? the first drive-in in, in the world that we know of was was in Memphis. Wow, um, okay. uh, it's an episode all on its own. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I'll look it up uh, and give you that info. But so these pits probably evolved into a drive-up, a drive-in type uh, place, and then they would start adding on to that to maybe build in a little bit of a, a area to sit, maybe walk-up counter. So if you look at the original Corky's, or if you look at like Tom's on Get Well, you can see where the buildings are a little bit weird because they've been added on to multiple times. So it went from pit to a small seating area to then a larger place. And now they ship them all. And a the pit, world. you just mean like like you would bring you would be having a barbecue on your backyard kind of a thing. Like there's an actual just pit that people come up and barbecue, kind of like a. Yeah, I mean, back in the day, it was a lot more primitive. You know, they would be, you know, maybe a pit in the ground way back in the day, but uh, those pits evolved into something that were stone or brick. And um, and now, the, you know, a lot of the pits, per se, are, mm -hmm. are high-tech, um, you know, kitchens. But, yeah. uh, you know... But the, dating as far back as to where you would walk up mm -hmm. and buy some barbecue. Yeah. And there's a, a, good, a great example of that in Brownsville, Tennessee. Helen's Barbecue is about as primitive. It's about the best example we have current day of what primitive barbecue would look like in the Mid-South. So she's got a little storefront there that in the back is a smokehouse and she's got cinder blocks that she's built. Um, it's just called the pit, but she'll have cinder blocks that inside of that she puts her charcoal that her husband actually starts a fire in the morning early before he goes to work and lets that become uh, seasoned to where she uses that to smoke the barbecue overnight. So, but there's no oven. Uh, there's a couple crock pots for sides, but you just, you walk up to this counter and there's a yeah. couple of seats in there and it's just some of the best barbecue we eat. So it's very, very primitive. It's, it's. And what is that one? Helen's in, in Brownsville, Tennessee, about an hour away. And then Bozo's in Mason, Tennessee. I think it's the oldest freestanding pit in West Tennessee that, um, so there's, there's a lot of history. There's, there's a lot of places that are still, um, run like they were from yeah. ages ago yeah. or they, they're still run in a similar way, but they've adapted to busier streets and more clientele. So they've got you know, the foot traffic. Yeah. Or, yeah. Or, okay. They've got a, a place for people to sit and they've got waiters or whatever, but it's, it all evolved from that primitive pit, probably, for most of them. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just fascinating how these joints evolved uh, into sit-down restaurants. And you think that Corky's on Poplar was one that turned into a drive-in, possibly? I would I would think so. Well, I don't know because I'm, I'd am i have to go back and research some of that, that history. I don't specifically know. But just looking at the building, it looks like it's definitely been added on it to. It was had add-ons um, to yeah. it. Um, and, you know, you think it's right there near the railroad tracks. It's... You know, at one point Poplar was a dirt road and probably a lot of a lot of traffic with uh, horses and pedestrians, and then that evolved into cars. And so over time, it was probably the stop for cars in the fifties. And I think places like that that when we look at them, you know, we see them today and think, oh, that building's a little different, or it's in an interesting location. But they've probably been there for sixty plus years, uh, wow. or maybe even the pit longer than that. Would you happen to know what the oldest Memphis barbecue could be? It's Leonard's. Um, really? Mm -hmm. That's that's what I understand, that Leonard's is the oldest That's barbecue. still running. Yes, that's, that's okay. currently running, yeah. yes. And I believe that. No, I haven't ever been to Leonard's. It's great. It is. What would you recommend at Leonard's? You know, when I went, they, they actually, I believe it's every Tuesday and Thursday, they have a 
buffet, and so you can order a um, buffet. Yeah, they, they, you I've can order off the menu. I've never been to a barbecue buffet before. Yeah. So that's that's the next uh, trip for you to go get the, the buffet. <laughs> you can get ribs, you can get chicken, and then no a way. lot of the what I would call more soul food sides. Um, but Leonard's is, I think Leonard's is such a neat picture of Memphis. I think it feels like Memphis. It's older, it's historic. Um, you see people from all over across different racial and economic lines there, just uh, breaking bread together, having a great time. And so it's just a rich experience to go to Leonard's. So, okay. Yeah. You have and to where go. is Leonard's? Uh, Mount Moriah area. Okay. So, yeah. Um, Interstate. Yeah. Do you know the story behind Coastal? Am I do. Am I saying that right? Coastal? Um, Coastal, yeah, coleslaw. Uh, so, well, I know how. I don't know the story behind it in in like depth, but why it pairs with the barbecue here? That's a great question. From what I understand, coleslaw was served as a side in a lot of ways, probably because how it's consisted and, and made up. It's just a cultural side to the South, but um, I do know it started. So, I don't know exactly know how it became a side, but I do believe that Leonard's started the idea of putting coleslaw on a sandwich because they were running lower on meat and they started putting coleslaw on the sandwich to make the really? meat stretch further. So, um, they may have started this tradition mm -hmm. of putting coleslaw on yeah. the burger yeah. or sorry, you know, on the sandwich. The sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> and there's some neat innovations like the commissary in Germantown. I believe it's a lady named Rosie Maybon or Mabin. Uh, forgive me if I pronounce it wrong, but she innovated into barbecue, into barbecue nachos. So if you've had barbecue nachos, yeah, that was something new that I yeah. hadn't yeah. in Texas. It was the barbecue spud. Okay. And then here, it was nachos, which... Yes, which are wonderful. Amazing. I, I believe the story goes, she's on a lunch break. Her manager asks her what she's doing, and she's like, I'm making barbecue nachos, you fool. What do you think I'm doing? And, you know, it was kind of born... That's where it that. came. She brought some, <laughs> some nachos to, to work and was putting pork on it. and Kind of like when people put Cheetos in their sandwich, and then maybe it catches on. Yeah, I don't think I've tried that. <laughs> Is that a staple around the Phillips home? No, okay. but I, I mean, Sounds I did awesome. when I was... Younger, okay. but I know there's people that put chips in their sandwich. <laughs> yeah. The other neat thing about barbecue is this is how popular uh, barbecue was in the 50s is that pizza had not really caught on in the South, at least, or in America for, for that matter, but it was kind of a new thing. And Memphis was so ingrained in barbecue that what you think of now is pizza is so prevalent. You have pizza at everything. I've got teenagers and you just I work with students, mm -hmm. you eat pizza all the time. But Coletta's could not sell pizza very well. So to sell it, they would put barbecue on it to get people to buy it. And so the barbecue pizza was actually invented in Memphis as well. And Amazing. so it, now you would From think the reverse, like, oh, we put barbecue on pizza. That's kind of different or new. But no, that's is really how um, pizza's started selling in Memphis was through barbecue. And that sounds like it was from a while back. Yeah. It's that'd not be in any new 50s, invention. Yeah. In the 50s, you think? Yeah. Oh, so wow. That seems to be when the pizza started catching on. So, uh, but yeah, it's been decades of barbecue pizza in Memphis. So. Oh, yeah. I eat that all yeah. the time. Yeah. It's you know, great. Twice like a week. Two great things kidding. mixed. <laughs> yeah, um, I know. Pizza, barbecue pizza, barbecue <laughs> nachos. Born in Memphis, do you think? Yeah. Wow. That's what history would say. As I started researching this, I back ended some ways into the barbecue of just researching uh, manhood ceremonies and just some things with race. And, and that led me to barbecue, although I already loved barbecue. But a great book that um, was written by a, a local gentleman named Craig David Meek uh, called Memphis Barbecue, A Succulent History of Smoke, Sauce, and Soul. has been a really neat book, and I would recommend that to your audience uh, and to you. Uh, I think it, it, it's so rich in just the history of barbecue, but also just rich with Memphis history. Some of the barbecue places, what they've originated from, thinking through like the barbecue shop on Madison, who is owned by Eric Vernon. But back in the day, um, Vincent Brady, I believe was his name, he and his wife had connected with one of the Neelys. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but they had, I guess, lived in the same neighborhood. He had talked through the Neelys with some of his recipes. And so you think about Neely's Barbecue and Interstate, uh, that's kind of a family uh, run run place that those were birthed out of this gentleman and so was the barbecue shop. So there's there are these trees of, of different barbecue that was born out of relationships of different people. And the book goes into some of those things and, and just the history behind that, which is really neat. So. Very nice. We'll make sure to put that on our show notes, yep. which by the way is memphistypehistory.com slash barbecue. 
And for those who generally spell barbecue BBQ, we'll actually make it B-A-R-B-E-Q-U-E. Is that how you spell it? Yes. Okay. That's right. So yeah, make sure to visit our show notes for that book reference as well. So I do want to ask you, since we've been talking about the different inventions that have come up with how to treat barbecue, would you say each place has their own little, like we, we get that Coletta's has the barbecue pizza to try. I feel like barbecue shop has Texas toast that I don't see anywhere else. Yeah. Like there that's are, their thing. Yeah. I feel like the, the beauty of Memphis barbecue is that it's, it's all excellent. I've never eaten bad barbecue in Memphis. Now there's different things at different places that I prefer, but there, there are little nuances at different places that barbecue shop has the Texas toast or um, you know, Central has the chips, the homemade chips. The homemade that, chips, yeah. Um, you know, so there there are differences. I, I know Cozy Corner, they're wonderful with barbecue, but they also have the the smoked um, game hens or the chickens, rotisserie that. chickens. So it's okay. there. There are a lot of different nuances that you, I, I would just really for your audience say get out and just explore and try some of these places. You know, one barrier that I, I think people that or a couple barriers that keep people from really appreciating and getting out and trying more barbecue. One is the cost, and barbecue can be expensive. It, it, chopped sandwiches can go a long way and feed a lot of people, so that's that's usually what gets eaten the most. But ribs are a, a just a an art form. You wouldn't think about paying you know eighteen dollars for a steak as being very expensive, but a, a rack of ribs that cost fifteen to twenty bucks that seems expensive. But when you think about the process of what the ribs go through to be cooked, you've got a pit master who has to really understand the pit and the smoke and the heat and the meat and it's got to be cooked to a different specifications over time. And these guys are artists. I mean they're culinary artists. And so when you go to a barbecue restaurant and you eat ribs, I mean you're eating some of the finest cooked meat in the world, literally in yeah. Memphis. And I don't think people will see that. And you know, I think another barrier, I, I think for me growing up, I always uh felt like barbecue was undercooked because there were there were you know, places that were pink in the barbecue. <laughs> and I've heard other people mention like, well, it's not really done. And to understand that pink is is part of the chemical process that happens when the smoke hits the meat and it's, it's called the smoke ring oh. and it's a it's an actual chemical yeah. process. So the the actual pink shows that it's been cooked correctly. It's not undercooked. And so uh, I think as people really understand what they're eating and the history behind it and how much of a delicacy it is, I think people appreciate it more. And it's not just uh, let me grab a pulled pull pork sandwich, but let me really dive in and experience all that these barbecue shops um, or places, uh, not just the barbecue shop, but barbecue uh, places, restaurants, really what they have to offer. Even the sides, how they complement uh, different cuts of meat and, and different tastes of, and flavors of barbecue. So, you know, I think the mac and cheese is, is really interesting with uh, barbecue because it's something about that cheese getting mixed in with the barbecue sauce that makes uh-huh. it really, you know, same idea on the nacho. So, you know, there's just a lot to explore. And, and I, I really appreciate Memphis that uh, a lot of these barbecue places are minority owned. And I would uh, really encourage uh, the audience to go out and explore and just see what a blessing uh, these uh, restaurants are and how uh, just the rich stories uh, we would go and sit when we were part of this barbecue barbecue club, uh, just sit and talk to the owners uh, about their story. How did this restaurant begin? A lot of them are family run places and it's an experience, not just a meal. It's an experience. So yeah, yeah but yeah, every place has its own unique thing that sets it apart and you have to in Memphis because everything's so good you have to be a little different than the other guy to to keep it um, interesting for people so yeah which would you recommend as far as the one that gets kind of the underdog of them all to make sure they get some love like I still haven't tried interstate yeah I know that's a famous one but gosh that's a tough question because I think they you know a lot of them that might feel mainstream underdog then you'll like Helen's in, in Brownsville or Tom's Barbecue or Cozy Corner, but and then they've been on major food network shows. And so, oh, you know, they yeah. may not, we may think of some of the bigger enterprises, but some of the smaller places have been uh, world renowned food shows coming in to, to do stories on it. So um, I don't know if there's a real underdog in Memphis. I think, you know, it's hard for me to mention just one because I love them all. <laughs> um, but I, I would say whatever area of town you're in, start there, support, uh, that. support that, appreciate that. Yeah. But, you know, I remember early days, we just took a map there. There's actually a map 
uh, that you can get Mud Island that has all of the barbecue locations in Memphis, um, or maybe it's on Bill Street. But you can actually, I mean, obviously you can pull up a map on Google, but but there's you know you can get a map and try one a month, and I think it'll bless your soul uh, in a lot of ways. So, um, <laughs> well, we'll make sure to put that on yeah. our show notes as well. We'll put a list of all of them. What's interesting too that I do not have enough knowledge on there. Are people that do here in Memphis, but just the world championship, the Memphis and May barbecue world championships that that was innovated in Memphis. That was a new thing that Memphis started. But a lot of these places had won the Memphis and May competition and that's what launched their business. Really? You know, so first they, it was this festival. Mm-hmm. They kind of got their product out there and tested yeah. and tasted mm-hmm. and then they moved up from there. Yeah. But yeah, it's a lot of interesting history. And I, and I think, you know, some of them, again, are family owned places that go back a ways. Um, some of them are newer places that are a larger enterprise. And, and so just like any restaurant, you can have your mom and pop places and you can have your larger uh, franchises. But Memphis is blessed that a lot of the uh, original pits and original restaurants that have been here for a long time are still here. So yeah. it's something to experience. And I think that's why they have such a good product. It's not just because of how long they've been here, but because they are mom and pop shops. They aren't franchises. Yeah. So they get to really focus and hone in on what they're what they're doing here. And mm-hmm. I feel like those are always the best places, the ones that are just kind of the, the hole in the wall. What I find amazing is that the city can support that many mm-hmm. mom and pop barbecue shops. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It is. And it's it's hard to replicate because it's such a long process to cook and you have these pit masters that are artisans and so it's it's not just they go replicate this somewhere else by installing a kitchen and hiring a couple Mm -hmm. uh you know new employees it's it's you you really have to find the right people that can that can do it right so um, and barbecue springing up all over you know you've got uh, especially up north you've got southern barbecue being uh marketed there and and but you, you don't have the same It'd be similar if I wanted to eat Chicago-style pizza in Memphis. I can probably find some that I like, but it's not like eating it in Chicago. Right. Well, eating barbecue here in Memphis um, is so much richer and tastier than eating it in another city. So. Speaking of, I just thought about barbecue spaghetti. Is <laughs> Do you like that? Have you tried it? You know, I don't love it, but I like it okay. Um, Was that something that also started here? It did. It started with, from what I understand, the barbecue shop on Madison, which wasn't on Madison at the time. But when uh, the previous owner started that, and you know, it, it's something that I'm not sure the whole history behind it. Um, I can tell you it's Brady Vincent, who owned the barbecue shop before the Vernons. And so he developed barbecue spaghetti. And it's <laughs> it's interesting because of the sauces are obviously barbecue sauce and not spaghetti sauce, but there's some type of way they cook it that has an oiliness to it and the noodles are real soft. But it's it's a really neat thing that some people really, really love. And yeah. it's a it's a side. Um first time I tried it, I just tried it because it was so unique. I thought I've got to try this. And I liked mm-hmm. it okay, but I wouldn't did I it personally con- confuse your taste buds a little. I mean, it's fine. I I don't personally order it, but uh-huh. um, I've never just hated it when I had it. Or uh-huh. but I, there's I've eaten with people at the barbecue shop that love it. Yeah, um, same here. Definitely worth trying out. Yeah. And then also another one that I thought about was I only eat the burgers here because I love the burgers so much. But tops is that considered? A barbecue. Like, yeah, I mean, it's Topps Barbecue, but... It is, and, and I, I don't know the whole story, but I know Topps, um, when it originated, from what I understand, I think some of this comes from the book I referenced, really sought to be the fast food of barbecue. And so they're trying to mass produce it, and this is when McDonald's was really growing. And I've got a friend that says, um, you know, Topps Barbecue has the best burger in Memphis, which you just <laughs> said as well. Their barbecue's not terrible, but their burger's so good. But I don't... Uh, I think there's some different ways that they sought to market and mass produce that um, maybe you can't really rush it. Uh, yeah, Tops is great. My brother and I enjoy that uh, when he's in town at Christmas. And yeah, they're they're a great restaurant, local place. So, um, and there are a couple of the older pits in Memphis. A couple of their restaurants are some of the older pits that, are, that exist Topps in Memphis. Is, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah. But they're probably the closest to like a fast food yeah. barbecue that you can get. Yeah. yeah. This is interesting. Um, so... Bryant's Breakfast on Summer. Yeah. A lot of people know Bryant's Breakfast. Oh, yeah. Cash only. Yes. It used to be, I believe, a sit-down 
uh, restaurant with the waiters would have black ties on, kind of fancy. <laughs> it was fancy? Yes. <laughs> Bryant's was fancy? Yes, Bryant's was fancy. It was a destination. It had a different name back then? Yeah. It wasn't Bryant's, but so, you know, just some things like that that have evolved over time. And we talked a little bit about race and I want to, I want to mention a couple of things on that. Um, but yes, let me go back to the drive in because uh, I'd mentioned the America's first drive, <clears throat> excuse me, first drive in. And that was Fortune's Jungle Garden. And right. I'm not sure where their location was, but that was uh, historically seen as the first drive in. I mentioned I got into some of this through exploration of racial history in Memphis and I won't go into my history, but um, we, you know, if I just always had a heart growing up in, in West Tennessee and around Memphis for uh, just racial reconciliation. And, and that's what I've given my life to here at Fellowship Memphis and uh, a lot of what our family's been about. And it's been neat to see how barbecue has transcended like I mentioned before, economics and race um, and been, been really in, in some ways, when you think about Bill Street and the, the music and I guess on the dawn of that age um, with, with the civil rights movement, you know, Bill Street's music was the blues and its meal was barbecue and its message was civil rights. And so when I think of barbecue and race in Memphis, I, I look at just how tied in it is to Bill Street and, and to the civil yeah. rights movement. Um and there, there's a quote that I discuss um, that I think really captures Memphis and that Memphis was a city, is a city, painted on the canvas of the Mississippi Bluffs, written to the score of the blues, soul, and rock and roll, and flavored with the smoke of tragedy, hard work, and grit. And I think that kind of encompasses Memphis as a city, Memphis with its history and great things like the blues and rock and roll and soul music that were all born out of Memphis and, and barbecue as well. That All these things were kind of birthed at the same time, just the racial struggle and the, the, the struggle for civil rights and the development of barbecue it was just kind of in the backdrop of that, but also tied into that and, and just the way that music really was a place where people, and Bill Street specifically, were, was a place where people could come and be different racially and it not be weird or not be frowned upon. I they, love that. it's kind of the wild west of yeah. Memphis, and anything went on Bill Street. But in a good way, it birthed a lot of relationships. And you even research Elvis's life; he was very progressive racially uh, in the music world with with different musicians and people he did uh, music with. And he's a big barbecue lover. Uh, I believe Leonard's was his spot. So, you know, there there's a lot of history there that all intertwines. Uh, at the same yeah. time, they all in some ways uh, came to a head at the same time in Memphis. I love that. That's a good quote. I need to include that as well. Well, Brian, thank you so much. Yeah, glad to be for here. For sharing about barbecue. I'm going to go eat some ribs right now. And then after that, I might go get um, a sandwich from Leonard's. <laughs> yes. Well, I w yeah, I'd love to revisit this at some point and talk more specifically about what different barbecue places, what you like and and what um maybe even what some of your audience prefers and it's a big argument around memphis but it's a fun one to have it's lighthearted. but yeah it's a good uh, debate yeah it's a great debate are to you have. gonna tell us what your favorite is no <laughs> because i really don't have a pure favorite i have different ones i'm in a mood for at different times but yeah i don't think what's I your could... what's your neighborhood one what's your closest well, proximity-wise to me now, one and only is the, the closest restaurant to my house there on Kirby, um, and then the commissary is close. I live in, in Germantown. Here at work, we frequent Central, Cozy Corner, barbecue shop, just because of the location that we're at. But, I mean, I'll drive. We'll drive to South Haven, Memphis Barbecue Company. We'll drive to Tom's on Get Well. You know, Helen's in Brownsville. You know, we've driven there for uh, guys get away from work for a day, lunch, treat yeah. so you know if it's in driving distance i'm going to try to you know frequent it at some point i don't have a favorite per se um, all right so i appreciate you having me and look forward to hearing more as y'all continue on the podcast and love what you're doing here in memphis and appreciate you so yeah thank you yeah all right everyone go eat some barbecue and as you're eating your barbecue visit our show notes it's memphis type history.com slash barbecue this is memphis type history the podcast and we like your type You've been listening to Memphis Type History, the podcast. It would mean so much to us if you head over to iTunes and give us a rating and review. Be sure to subscribe and never miss an episode. Want to be part of Memphis Type History and get behind the scenes content, merch, and more? Support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash Memphis Type History. 
That's Patreon, spelled P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Memphis Type History. Find more Memphis Type History on our blog at MemphisTypeHistory.com, on Facebook, Instagram, and Pinterest as Memphis Type History, and on Twitter at Memphis Type. 